Okay, welcome. Um, schönen guten Abend. I wish you a very warm welcome uh, from Innsbruck here to our uh, book presentation uh, slash panel discussion uh, on uh, the German translation of Michael Rothberg's uh, not so new uh, book, Multidirectional Memory, um, uh, Holocaust Memory in the Age of Decolonization, so the German title, and then can show you the book here, actually, uh, the German title, Multidirektionale Erinnerung, Holocaust Gedenken im Zeitalter der Dekolonisierung. Um, so the German translation that came just out with the Metropol uh, Verlag in, uh, uh, in Berlin. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the Institute for Contemporary History Uh, at the University of uh, Innsbruck. And it's also a great pleasure to co-host uh, this event with uh, our friends and colleagues at the University of uh, Graz, uh, of the Center for South uh, Eastern European uh, Studies, um, which is uh, Bilgin Ayata, who's joining me here um, on the panel. Bilgin, hi, maybe you... You can say just hi that you get into the picture. Yes. Nice. Hello. Hello. Thank you, uh, Dirk, for the introduction and also very warm welcome from my side to everyone who's watching now. Great. Thanks, Birgen. Thanks for doing this uh, little uh, uh, cooperation across uh, Austria from the very west to the southeastern part of, of the country. Uh, It's also a pleasure to co-host this with our favorite uh, local bookstore in uh, Innsbruck, which is uh, Lieber Wiederin, and you can order the book uh, through Lieber Wiederin. Uh, so usually, if we wouldn't be in Corona times, we would have the book present, and, and if we could afford bringing Michael Rothberg uh, over the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> to Innsbruck. Uh, then we would have the book presentation at uh, uh, usually at this local bookstore in uh, Innsbruck, um, which is our favorite location for, uh, for uh, occasions like uh, that. And of course, uh, a very warm welcome uh, to our guest and um, to the uh, main person uh, tonight, which is Michael Rothberg. Um, Uh, and uh, he's uh, coming to us from Los Angeles. So, uh, Michael, maybe you want to say hi, that we can see you. Uh, hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Excellent. Greetings from Los Angeles. <laughs> <clears throat> Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, really, thank, thank you for making this uh, possible. Um, that's... Uh, as far as I can see, one or maybe the only good side of the corona pandemic that we are um, able to do things like that. With that, I mean, we, we could have done that before, but we never did somehow. Um, uh, although Zoom existed before uh, corona, obviously, um, and and we know how it worked, but, uh, but I think we usually uh, didn't use it this way. So now it's much easier to bring people together Uh, across the globe for for panel discussions like that to invite them to our seminars and lecture lectures and so on, which is really uh, uh, yeah that's one of the good effects of it. Makes it a little bit more global, also our classrooms uh, and uh, and these events that we usually have only on a local uh, level. So really, thanks for joining me. I know it's very early in uh, LA, only nine in the morning, but uh, Thanks for uh, being here uh, with us. Um, so let me maybe start by introducing very quickly um, um, our two guests or, or my co-host and our guest, uh, Michael Rothberg. Um, let me start with Bilgin Ayata, though. Um, Bilgin is uh, currently... Uh, professor, as I already said, at the Center for Southeastern European Studies at the University of Graz, and she actually just moved to Graz, I think, uh, last year to this new 
um, position, so only took it up very uh, recently. Uh, Bilgin uh, studied at the University of uh, Mannheim uh, in Germany and also at York University in Toronto, Canada. Uh, and expert in sociopolitical transformation processes uh, with a special focus on migration, racism, effects and emotions, religion, social movements, intersectional and post-colonial um, studies. And again, thanks for doing this together with me. Um, and there is, of course, uh, Michael Rothberg. Uh, Michael Rothberg is... Um, it's actually interesting, and we should talk about this later, because in, uh, even in, on Wikipedia, you come out, out as a historian. I'm sure you noticed that uh, before, but it's actually not true. Uh, so you're actually a literary uh, scholar. And I think that's important also to understand your, uh, uh, your books and your approach to the topic, and maybe we can really talk about that uh, later. So Michael Rothberg is currently... Um, Professor of English and Comparative Literature and the 1939 Society Samuel Goetz Chair in Holocaust Studies at the University of California in Los Angeles, which is actually the chair that was held by uh, Saul Friedlander before. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so that's actually a very important uh, position in the field of uh, Holocaust Studies um, uh, globally so to say. Uh, Michael held uh, positions before at uh, the University of Miami and before he moved to uh, UCLA a few years ago uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he was also the director of the Illinois Unit for Criticism and Interpretive uh, Theory. Um, just to mention uh, two other books uh, published by Michael, and at least about the most recent one that he published in English after multidirectional memory, we need to talk about a little bit later, I guess. Uh, so this one, the, the most recent book of Michael, is uh, The Implicated Subject. I also have it, uh, uh, have it here, again, with the Stanford uh, University uh, Press, the implicated subject beyond victims and perpetrators. Uh, so you can also see in the title that it's very closely related, um, again, to questions of uh, not only Holocaust representation, but uh, questions of uh, yeah, how to deal in representation with, let's say, the Holocaust, genocides, and other mass crimes. Um, uh, and um, before uh, he published Multidirectional Memory in English in 2009, uh, let me mention Traumatic Realism, the Demands of Holocaust uh, Representation. So you can really see that Michael is an expert in these questions of uh, not only Holocaust representation, but started with Holocaust representation and then moved on um, to, uh, yeah, to multidirectional memory. And we will talk about that in greater detail, what that actually means and what it uh, uh, entails. Um, on the one hand, it's very weird to have a book presentation of a book that is already 12 years old, and we should also talk about that, how that feels uh, for an author, uh, because you would think everybody has read it already because English is the global language of scholarship anyway, so why would you need a German translation? Uh, so that's one of the weird things. Um, but at the same time, we are all confronted with the fact that uh, the German translation comes uh, at a very, uh, yeah, very, I don't know, significant, significant uh, point in time where uh, many of the things that you took up uh, in 2009 in your uh, important book uh, are very much at the heart of uh, public debate, especially uh, in Germany. And the good thing is that the German translation of the book also comes with an interview at the beginning and a postscript uh, that somehow 
um, locates uh, the book um, in these current German debates, or not only the current German debates, but also what went on basically since 2009, and that's obviously a lot. Um, and um, uh, I mean, just to mention a few things, um, and this here is also somehow part, I mean, it's not really part, but it's somehow uh, a side effect of uh, our lecture series on the deep, the German debate on uh, the um, uh, historian and thinker Achille Bembe uh, that started last year in uh, Germany um, and has still not come to an end as far as I can um, see. Um, but when Michael's book came out, it also became somehow part of that discussion. So I would rather propose to call it now the Bember Rothberg uh, debate because it's it's all is somehow implicated, as you would say, uh, or or interwoven uh, with each other, and and um, and the topics that come up in the Bember debate are very close to the topics that you bring up. Uh, in your book, uh, Multidirectional Memory. Um, and so it's, uh, it has been very heavily criticized, let's put it that way, in the, for the short version uh, at the beginning, um, uh, in the German Feuilleton, for example, and we will talk about that also in greater detail later, I'm sure, um, what the different aspects are that, uh, that are in the focus there. Um, but that's the amazing thing of a book that uh, that is actually 12 years old and it's in, um, got translated only recently, that it's really um, in the middle of an ongoing uh, or at the center of an ongoing debate now, which is mainly a debate on uh, the current status of Holocaust memory, uh, not only in Germany, but uh, worldwide. Uh, and how Holocaust memory relates to the memory of other mass crimes, uh, most importantly of uh, colonialism, and what does and what that means for our um, diverse uh, migrant post migrant uh, societies, and that's certainly the case for Germany that it is uh, post more migrant. Um, society. So how do we deal in these very diverse post-migrant societies in these days with Holocaust memory and the memory of other mass atrocities uh, and experiences? Um, uh, there are also other, let's say, extensions to this debate. One is uh, a very interesting one on uh, uh, what some uh, people call the Nazi Hintergrund, and uh, Michael and uh, myself had the pleasure to be part of that, also in a, um, uh, a short video format a few uh, weeks ago. And that's also a debate that is very close, I think, to the issues that we are talking about here tonight and that you brought up in your uh, book and in your new book, The Implicated Subject. So that's also interesting um, I think this uh, Nazi hintergrund debate is very closely connected to the two books uh, that you wrote. Uh, and we will also go into that in more detail um, a little bit later. Uh, so maybe that for the beginning. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to have you here. Um, and so we, we uh, um, have a very loose and informal choreography uh, for this year. Uh, I mean, it's obviously needed if, if you meet on Zoom um, and not in real life. Um, so um, our plan is that Michael will start uh, uh, with a statement um, on his book and on the translation of his book. And again, yeah, this, uh, this weird thing of uh, uh, seeing your book back uh, in the debate after 12 years. Um, and uh, we'll explain a little bit what the book is actually about. And then we have a, a statement of Bilgin. I will go back into the discussion. We will maybe have a discussion among us here um, on the podium, so to say. Uh, and then we are happy to open it up to you in the audience. Um, if you go to the website, you will find a link um, for, for a chat. And you can... Uh, 
uh, type in your questions there in the chat and uh, Bill Gideon and I will bring them up here um, then um, and, uh, and um, uh, bring it up to Michael. Uh, okay, uh, so Michael, uh, thanks again for joining us from Los Angeles and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk with uh, Birgin and Dirk, who are two of my favorite people in general, but also two of my favorite people for talking about some of these issues surrounding the politics of memory um, that Dirk has already evoked and that we're going to go into, I think, in more depth. Um, I'm especially curious to learn how some of these issues play out in Austria, if someone wants to talk about that, because that is a context that I really know much less about um, than the context in Germany, which I follow pretty closely, though, in recent years uh, from a bit of a distance as well, of course. Um, I think it's important to say right at the beginning that this was not a book that was written for a German or Austrian audience. Um, but more important than that, because it was also not a book that I wrote specifically for any national audience, is the fact that it was a book that wasn't really written for our present, right? It was, as uh, you already know, published 12 years ago, and I started working on it 20 years ago, which is really kind of incredible. And what's striking to me is how, on the one hand, we're still talking about the same things. We're still talking about Blacks and Jews. We're talking about Israelis and Palestinians, especially these days. We're talking about identity politics and race. We're talking about the so-called competition of victims. It's not a phrase I particularly like myself, but it gets used, so I refer to it as an element of the discourse. Yet, on the other hand, despite all of those similarities, it also does feel like we're in a very different moment. And of course, much time has passed. And the context in Germany, where much of the reception of the translation has been so far, of course, um, is in some ways very particular and maybe has changed itself in, in, in recent years. And that's something we can talk more about. I want to start by giving a bit of a summary of the origins and the arguments of the book. I don't presume that everybody has read it or knows about it. And if you've read about it from in the hands of other people, you may have a distorted understanding of what the book actually is. So I'll try to clarify some of that. Um, though certainly with an eye to the current debates and the reception in Germany. And then we'll sort of see how far we get, and I look forward to the discussion especially. So this is how I, this is how I see the origins of the book now, and I'm not sure I ever put it in quite these terms before. What I would say, though, is that the book was written in response to the responses to the globalization of Holocaust memory that took place in the first decade after the end of the Cold War, right? My book is a response to the responses to that globalization, especially the responses that, that, that I found in the US, but not uniquely there by any means. And there are both similarities and differences across national contexts. Um, this globalization, uh, partial as it was, of course, was a continuation of processes that you could certainly trace back to, let's say, 1961 and the Eichmann trial. And that's a moment that's very important for my book, and I'll come back to it. Or if you like, to 1978, 79 and the Holocaust miniseries and the impact that that had. But I do think that there's a qualitative as well as quantitative change that takes place in terms of what we could call Holocaust memory after 89 and at the end of the Cold War. Now, the responses to which I was responding um, seemed to be diametrically opposed, yet what I perceived was a kind of common logic underlying them. So the increasing presence of the Holocaust or Holocaust memory in the public sphere, think Schindler's List and the opening of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, both 1993, a very key moment in this story, um, prompted some to worry that the Holocaust's prominence um, was blocking other histories from articulation. In the US, this was particularly about histories of slavery, but also the genocide of indigenous people. In other places, let's say France, um, and today in Germany, it has to do with uh, the history of colonialism as well, of course. Now, the articulation of that worry, right, that the Holocaust was blocking these other histories uh, from being articulated and remembered, um, then prompted uh, a response from those uh, invested in the promotion of Holocaust memory to a prominent place to assert that the presence of these other histories would relativize or even deny uh, the Holocaust its rightful place uh, in public consciousness, right? So 
So what you had then common to these two positions uh, were rather symmetrical worries uh, about what I came um, to define as the logic of the zero sum game. Right, The idea shared by the adversaries in this exchange, if you could call them that, that the presence of one group's collective memory necessarily displaced the collective memory of another group. Right, Too much Holocaust memory means not enough memory of slavery. The memory of slavery would somehow relativize and deny the prominence of Holocaust memory. What I came to see, though, is that if you looked at this debate from a bit of a greater distance, if you sort of zoomed out from the perspective of the uh, participants themselves, that things actually played out differently. And that the so-called competition of victims, or what I rephrased as competitive memory, um, uh, actually produced more memory, right? Not less, and could not be described according to the logic of the zero-sum game. We talk, in other words, this was a key feature of my argument, more about colonialism and slavery today because we talk so much about the Holocaust. And in fact, I think I'd say that we continue to talk so much about the Holocaust today because we're also talking about uh, colonialism and slavery. And I also, there's a historical dimension I'll come to as well, which complicates that even a little bit more. Now in Germany today, to make my first kind of reference to the current debate, I do think that things are playing out differently. I don't see the same, this is something we could debate. I don't see the same kind of symmetry between the contested positions that I noted, especially in the US context in the early 2000s. Rather what I see, and it's complicated for sure, and, and I'm happy to talk more about it, debate it. I see an official consensus about the importance of preserving the place of the Holocaust in public memory. I see attempts at relativization of that centrality um, by the right, especially, IFD, et cetera. Um, I see changes uh, in generations, a growing generational distance from the events, which certainly has an impact on the kinds of memory that are still powerful. That's inevitable, but something to be discussed. And I also see that those who are working, and here's where I think the difference really is, those who are working to promote other currently marginalized memories, such as the memory of colonialism, are actually already working according to a multi-directional logic, it seems to me. And they're not working in the framework of competitive memory, right? So what they're trying to do is to extend recognition to marginalized histories like the history of colonialism and to, and I think this is really important, to minoritized subjects of memory, such as migrants, post-migrants, Sinti and Roma, black Germans, not in place of Holocaust memory, but alongside it. Right, and it seems to me that this is at least my impression, and I, you know, I'm sure there are, there are distinctions and differences one could make. I don't see a, 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 a two sides pitted against each other. I rather see uh, one side, uh, in fact, already kind of employing a certain kind of multi-directional logic and drawing on the productivity of memory. And this productivity of memory, whereby memories develop in dialogue, in exchange, is precisely what I call multidirectionality, the multidirectional dynamic of memory. That's the really the first argument of the book. And it's an argument both about Holocaust memory in particular, but it's also an argument about how cultural memory works in general, structurally. For In my understanding, cultural memory is structurally multidirectional. And there are two then further correlates which uh, comprise the other two major arguments of the book. The first is that we need to reconsider how we write the history of memories, and we need to write more entangled histories of memory. So in my book, what I attempt to do is write a history of Holocaust, rewrite a history of Holocaust memory um, alongside uh, memories of slavery and colonialism, and in the context of decolonization. Now, of course, other combinations are both possible and desirable, but of course this isn't an arbitrary conjunction either. The kind of intersections of Holocaust memory with, with these other histories is, is not arbitrary. It's not, as some German critics have said, a matter of everything in one pot, right? These are very specific things that I'm considering in one pot, and there's a historical logic for why these things actually belong together. And I think that's really important, and that often goes missing in some of the German reception. And the final our big argument that I make is that we also need to rethink the relation between memory and identity. Um, when I was talking about this sort of so-called competition of victims and competitive memory, I talked about the collective memory of groups. 
But I think this, this language is somewhat misleading. This is one of my arguments um, because it implies that memory is a property that is owned by a pre-existing group. And I believe instead that groups come into existence through the articulation of memories. In other words, the relationship between memory and identity is performative and not expressive, not given in advance, but processual and performative. And that the dialectic of groups and memories is one whose, whose borders are jagged and contingent and constantly changing. So the history of memory that I recommend shows much more overlap and exchange between and across and among groups. So just to give a you know, kind of quick shorthand example of what I mean, if you look, look at the motifs of say, uh, exodus uh, and slavery that actually serve as sites of intersection and exchange between Jewish cultures and Black cultures broadly, broadly conceived. And that's the sort of thing that I'm interested in. I think that's an important part of the dynamics of memory that hasn't always been appreciated. Now, in a lot of the talks I've been giving about the book, I've been using as an example to illustrate my arguments and also the normative vision that I see following from it um, is the example of the great African-American uh, scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and, I'll, and I'll do that briefly here, uh, pretty briefly, because people may have caught this in other venues or in things I've written. Um, and then I want to turn to another example at a little bit more length, which I think has interesting implications for the German debate, though that may not be obvious right, right off the bat. So Du Bois was interesting to me because of a, a, a visit that he made in 1949 to Warsaw, during which he visited especially the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto and also saw the newly uh, erected Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Monument by Nathan Rappaport. And he wrote an article, short article, three years later, called The Negro and the Warsaw Ghetto that was published in a Jewish communist magazine called Jewish Life. And in that article, he describes um, the relationship between anti-Black violence and the genocide against the Jews in what I think are really uh, quite productive and fascinating terms. And it's important to remember that he did this at a moment when there actually was no broad public understanding of the specificity or uniqueness, as we might say today, of the Holocaust, right? This is an early post-war moment when people were mostly talking about Nazi atrocities in a very generalizing way. And when what Du Bois witnessed in Warsaw in 49 and then wrote about in 52, he says, was in fact not equal to anything that he had seen before, right? He recognizes that there's a specificity to the form of violence that he sees in these ruins, right? As the kind of evidence of this violence, which, um, which is different from, in some ways, more radical than the very radical forms of racialized violence that he himself has experienced as a black American and would continue to experience as well. So he marks the distinction of Nazi genocide, of the Nazi genocide of the Jews at that moment. But at the same time, and I think this is the other step, which is so interesting and important for me, he also says what it got him to see was that his own experiences, his own experiences were not separate and, and, uh, and unique, right? So what the violence that he witnessed was not equal to other forms of violence, but at the same time, um, it kind of relativized his own position and got him to think relationally about how historical violence works. And it's this combination of the recognition of, a, of a, the specificity of different histories, but also the possibility of relationality in the interest of constructing solidarities across group identities, which for me is the kind of normative promise, the, the potential for solidarity um, that can emerge from the structural multi-directionality of memory. My, my argument is not that this is always what happens. Uh, we know very well that comparisons with the Holocaust are often um, done in ways that are in fact very competitive, sometimes even violent. Um, but there's a kind of potential for solidarity that comes out of that relationality, that multi-directionality that, that I found in, in Du Bois and not only in Du Bois. Um, but I wanted to move on to, to another example. As you see in the, in the example of Du Bois, and this is true of many of the examples in the book, the book treated overall um, experiences of victimization at the hands of different regimes of racism, which could at best create certain forms of cross-cutting solidarity as in the example of Du Bois. But I wanna actually 
evoke a, an example now of what you might call multidirectional perpetration um, to show how the dynamics of multidirectional memory can function right, in other ways as well. And I think this has interesting implications for the German case, as I'll try to argue. A central figure in my book is uh, the French police chief, Maurice Papon. So I wanna just say a few words about him and then kind of draw out the implications. Papon um, served in 1939 and 40 um, in the colonial infantry for the French um, in Libya, Syria, and Lebanon, and then was called back to Vichy, France, um, and given the position of sec uh, secretary general of the police in the Gironde region, which is where Bordeaux is. Bordeaux, I think, is the capital of this region. And he was given also the position of supervisor of Jewish affairs where he um, deported around 1,600 Jews, including uh, 130 children under the age of 13. So he was uh, quite closely connected to the genocide of Jews in France uh, through his work in the, in, in the, in the police force. After uh, the end of the occupation, after the end of the war, he was sent to Algeria uh, as uh, where he took part in colonial policing, uh, various practices of torture and uh, repression in Algeria in this period, right before the beginning of the Algerian war into the start of the Algerian war of independence. And then he was brought back to the metropole and became uh, chief of the Paris police, where in 1961, he was responsible for a massacre of up to 200 peacefully demonstrating Algerians in the streets of Paris who were protesting against a racist curfew. Um, what's interesting is that though his metropolitan police work and his colonial police work were, were sort of public knowledge, were, were obviously well known, his Nazi collaboration was not until much later. It was only in 1981 um, that that became known in a, in, a, in a newspaper expose. And then it took another uh, 15 years or more before he was put on trial in the late 1990s and rightly convicted for his crimes against humanity in the deportations, but not at all tried and not at all convicted for what he had done in the colonial period or the period of decolonization. So not for the massacre of 200 Algerians in 1961, not for torture or anything like that. Yet still in the context of his trial in the 1990s, the history of this October 17th, 1961 massacre did start to become better known through the testimony of Jean-Luc Ainaudi, who's a non-academic historian who had done some of the most important work at the time on recovering the history of the 1961 massacre. So this trajectory is fascinating to me for a number of reasons, which I think are relevant to some of the points that have come up in the German uh, reviews and discussion of my book. So some of those major issues concern the question of German responsibility, the specificity of German responsibility for the Holocaust, the relationship between colonialism and the Holocaust, and more broadly, the methodological and ethical questions of comparison and of coming to terms with the past in comparative contexts. So I want to make four points, and then maybe I'll I'll, I'll stop at that point, and, and we can open up the you know, continue with the discussion. Um, so first of all, Papon is a Menschmit Nazi Hintergrund. I think one would have to say, referring to that debate, he's a person with a Nazi background, but he's not German, right? So he exceeds the demand, which I think is present in a lot of the dominant German discourse. Um, to hold on to the uniqueness and absoluteness of German responsibility, right? So in other words, he brings to view the fact that the Holocaust was only possible because of a trans-European collaboration. And I think that's really important. And of course, that's well known, but it's being marginalized in the debate for explicitly political reasons, uh, it seems to me. And I think this plays out most importantly, in relationship now, not so much to France, where again, this is sort of well known and has been debated over many decades, but especially in relationship to Eastern Europe, Poland and Hungary, where there are very important debates going on right now about the complicity of local people in the genocide, which are being essentially repressed by right-wing authoritarian governments. And I think actually the German discourse is playing into that, perhaps inadvertently, but in the insistence on the absoluteness and uniqueness of German responsibility, they're giving kind of cover for some of these uh, far-right governments uh, in Poland and Hungary. So that's point one. Um, the second point is that it shows that the relationship between colonialism and the Holocaust is not, and it's 
in my book or in reality, a linear movement from colonialism, from the former to the latter, right? From colonialism to the Holocaust. One of the, you know, one of the uh, the critiques of my book has been that that I imply somehow that colonialism, or that Jürgen Simmer, for that matter, uh, implies that colonialism has caused the Holocaust, that there's a linear causal relationship. That's not at all what I argue in my book. I don't think it's what Jürgen Simmer argues either. Um, in fact, the relationship is much more complicated. As the example of Papon shows, it's multifaceted and it's nonlinear. And in this case, you might even say that the Holocaust crimes are a training for colonial ones, right? Although, of course, the colonial relations also precede the Holocaust. And I was just looking again at this important book about the 1961 massacre by Jim House and Neil McMaster called Paris 1961. And they write, while, while, uh, while talking about Papon's biography, what I just sort of summarized for you, they say, historians have failed to note that the techniques deployed by the Vichy regime to locate and identify the tens of thousands of Jews who could conceal themselves by merging into the vast anonymous crowds of the towns and cities were similar to the methods later used to track Algerian nationalists and to locate members of the minority community embedded in the, in the total French population. So methods developed you know, in the deportation of Jews were then you exported to Algeria. And what they also, but what they also emphasize is the circulation between metropole and colony, right, of the various personnel involved, again, both in uh, Vichy deportation, Vichy era deportations, but also repression of Algerians and of the anti-colonial movement in Algeria. So that's a second point. The relationship between colonialism and the Holocaust, as I understand it, is not linear, but is in fact uh, mul quite multifaceted and complex can't be reduced to the kind of caricatures that have been used to cr criticize uh, my book, I think. Um, third, I think it's important to emphasize that those colonial crimes remain unprosecuted and only partially remembered, right? So although this is a story about French colonialism in particular with Papon, I think it shows the extent to which colonia colonial era injustices remain unaddressed. Right? Though I think there's important, there's important movement on this issue going on right now in Germany and elsewhere about justice uh, in relationship to the colonial past. And, and, and that holds true for memory as well. And this is my fourth point. This is a, this is a, his, these are histories that have not achieved the representation, the, the recognition, the presence that they deserve until now. And yet, and here's the, here's the interesting point for me and for the book, to the extent that there has been a memory of October 17th, there's always been a component of it that has been multidirectional, right? That has linked that event in particular, those that massacre in 1961, Paris, to the events of the Nazi occupation, Vichy, and the Nazi genocide. And what's really interesting about this is it's not actually because of Papon's biography and his itinerary, which, as I said, was only, only discovered many years later, but already before that, before people even realized that there was this interesting personnel continuity in the figure of Papon, there, were all, there was already perception of a kind of multidirectional link between these different events. Why was that? I think there are three main reasons. One is that the proximity of the events, right? We're talking about events that happened barely 15 years after the end of the war, right? These were really closely followed on each other. And if you think about colonial violence, it was both, again, preceding the events and, and ongoing all the way through. So the events themselves are interwoven in time. Um, second, there is a there is a there is the presence of actors in both of these histories. Papon is one example, and his whole network of perpetrators brings together this, these two different uh, histories. But also, and this was the focus really primarily in the book, uh, people who were victims and resistors during the Nazi occupation were often always also resistors during the Algerian war. So you have kind of personnel continuities, as it were, linking these two different histories. And third, there was a perception that the forms of violence being deployed in both instances were similar, not identical, but similar. And the things that come up, and here I'm reading the debate, I'm not making a judgment myself that these things are the same, I'm reading the discourse that evolved in 50s and 60s France. It was references to torture, um, it was references to camps that the French had built both in Algeria and in France. And also there, there's a sort of discursive concentration on ghettos as well as a link across these different histories. 
And so you, you see this in, um, you know, again, what interested me especially was this kind of discourse of resistance to the war, anti-colonial activists in the metropole. And so for and one example of this would be after the events of October 61, um, uh, an image of Algerians who were being held in a sports stadium on the outskirts of Paris with a caption that read, doesn't this remind you of something? Doesn't this remind you? So evoking memory specifically, what does it remind you of? It reminds you of the Veldiv roundup in which thousands of Jews uh, during the war were rounded up and held in a sports stadium, right? And you can see various in juxtaposed images at the level of the image, they're the same at the level of the sort of form of political violence, there are certain similarities. Um, that, that I found numerous examples of that at the very moment itself of these events. Um, there's a an S, there's a short essay by Marguerite de Ross, the famous writer, called Les Deux Ghettos, the two ghettos, juxtaposing a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto with an Algerian worker living in one of the ghettos, the Bidonville, at the outskirts of Paris. Um, the first novel written about the 1961 massacre by an African American writer, William Gardner Smith, juxtaposes again a Holocaust survivor, um, the Algerian situation, as well as racism against African Americans in a kind of interesting differentiated constellation. This, uh, um, and I'll end in a, in a moment or two, this, um, these kinds of overlaps specifically related to the October 17th massacre can be found more broadly in this moment around 1961. And one of the texts I analyze closely is the first book published by the Auschwitz survivor, Charlotte Delbo, right, whose trilogy, Auschwitz and After, is one of the great testimonies about the camps that I know, and I think a lot of people would agree. But the first book that she published was a book called Les Belles Lettres in 1961, which was a collection of letters regarding the Algerian war, right? And so before she even published widely on the Holocaust, she had published in fact about the Algerian war. And there she quotes, for example, uh, Francis Janson, who was the head of an illegal network supporting the, Al the Algerian liberation uh, front, who in response to these camps that had been constructed again in Algeria and in France, asked this rhetorical question, must we console ourselves by holding on to the fact that in these camps, there are neither gas chambers nor crematoria. And Delbo, uh, in her own words, then says something very similar a few pages later. She says, there are, there are Algerians in camps in France, camps surrounded by barbed wire, camps surmounted by watchtowers where guards armed with machine guns keep watch. Of course, it's not Auschwitz, but isn't it enough that innocents, a priori people not condemned are innocent, are in camps for our conscience to revolt. And so the point I guess I'm trying to make here is that um, you, you find in a lot of these responses to what was happening during the Algerian war, the same kind of differentiated relation that you find in Du Bois, right? Neither Delbo nor Janson nor any of these other activists is saying that what's happening in Algeria or during this war is the same as what happened in Auschwitz, what's the same that happened in the Nazi camps. What they're saying is it can't help but remind you of that, right? So this is about, in other words, memory. It's not about creating identities between different histories. It's about asking the way that histories of violence evoke memories of other histories of violence. And that coming to terms with those histories um, remembering those histories is always going to happen, I think, inevitably in these relational comparative ways, right? And as a scholar, I guess what I was trying to do was to understand that dynamic and to try to, to take it for what it was and to try to analyze it. Um, not necessarily, this is not necessarily the way that I would go about doing politics, but I think it's the way that politics often happens. And, um, and we need to try to understand it. And we try to, and we need to, to think about the dynamics of memory and the ethics of comparison, I think. And I think I'll stop there because I probably talked long enough and I've got more to say, but, but I'll, I'm sure I'll have a chance. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a great uh, condensed version of the book in 25 minutes. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, hand it over to Bilgin. Bilgin, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dirk. And uh, thank you so much, Michael, uh, for um, 
these uh, uh, comments and these uh, thoughts uh, I've been using and teaching multidirectional memory in my classes for a very long time now, but it was so refreshing to listen to you again, summarizing and reflecting back uh, on your own book. So thank you very much. Uh, for that. Now you raised so many interesting uh, points that all invite for <laughs> uh, very interesting uh, discussions. I'll try to be um, very short and let me uh, also say that I would leave the uh, part uh, how this relates or is relevant for um, Osser to Dirk since he already said that I'm here since only one year so I will speak more about the German context if that's okay. Um, I wanted to first uh, very briefly say also as a reader and colleague and uh, res um, uh, 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 someone who uh, has benefited greatly from the book also um, you know, went along with the book and the, or how my relationship to the book changed over the part of 12 years. Uh, I remember, I don't know in which conference this was, this is way long time ago. And uh, I remember that when you were using um, uh, the, the competition of the victims uh, for Konkurrenz, I was very, you know, I had a very effect, effective reaction to that, right? Like to uh, associate that. Um, and um, later on though, uh, over really at the time then, um, this was at the context, and I want to mention those two different contexts because I want to carry it for a minute out of the colonial context. At that moment, when I was first reading your book, I think it was 2010 um, or nine, uh, I was mostly engaged with the Armenian genocide, where in the context of Turkey, exactly this notion at that moment, um, a similar competition for memory was uh, going on with regard to Kurdish um, uh, violence against Kurds and uh, Armenians. So, right, and, and this association of this kind of um, uh, competition amongst the victims had an immediate, uh, right, protective, effective reaction. And um, I do think though, and maybe this is here again, um, the, our very interdisciplinary panel that we are having today, right? From coming here also from very diff different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, it uh, seems to me though, I think um, that uh, uh, what mattered to me very much was this notion of recognition, uh, right? And if we look at this from the perspective of memory, we can maybe speak uh, of, of this kind of a competition. But when we look at recognition uh, of those genocides that are recognized and those who are not, um, we, there, there is a problem, right? What kind of an agency do you have to enter such a competition? That was why what I was grappling with. And um, then I was uh, at the FU Berlin, <laughs> at a free university in Berlin. And you know the story, Michael, but um, uh, I was back then teaching at the Otto Zoo Institute, um, which was uh, home before it became the building of the Otto Zoo Institute, uh, was the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Eugenics and uh, Genetics. And when you were entering the building, there was a um, plaque, commemorative plaque, because um, not only Mengele had been teaching there and uh, doing race research, but it was uh, 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 the offices of Eugen Fischer um, and uh, Otto van Berschur. And there was this plaque that one could not even read. Uh, and it was only referring to the race research that was conducted from 33 to 45. I mean, that was the commemorative plaque. But of course, the colonial, the history of race research begins much earlier during um, uh, uh, German colonialism and Eugen Fischer was himself in what was then uh, uh, Southwest Africa and uh, today's Namibia and bringing skulls, right? So in that time, I discovered another important part and power of the book, which is um, in addition to its intellectual and, and analytical uh, power, um, there's something extremely, uh, I think, very um, uh, 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 um, you, in, in your comments, you were just saying, well, you know, that's politics, but it's also really extremely um, useful to engage in political conversations. I mean, the book um, in the way, I mean, not only the concept itself and the idea of multidirectional memory, but the book is, has such an, um, is a conversation facilitator and it really distinct, is distinctive in that regard, and I find that this is a very, you know, very important uh, aspect. Um, it would be too, too long to go in detail into um, that engagement back then, um, 
at the Otazu Institute what kind of discussions were there, but um, the, when uh, bringing in the concept of multi-directional memory, a very different discussion became possible. And that was my you know, own encounter uh, at not uh, as a, in, in political terms with, this, uh, with the power of this term, right? So in that way, I think it's really important and very good that is now translated also. Um, and I've been following uh, the discussions uh, it has received, I mean, Dirk already mentioned it, uh, really very, very um, large attention. Uh, considerable. I mean, not every book is, you know, being discussed so much. And the member Rothberg affair has been occupying now quite a bit, uh, the German uh, newspaper, the Feuilletons. And following that, and there are two, um, I'm not sure if I, you know, if I sh should be hopeful or depressed about when reading some of them. And I think I decided I'm both. Um, there's definitely a good reason uh, to be both hopeful and a little bit depressed. So the the hopeful part, I would say, is really uh, when looking at this um, very strong, uh, passionate, and effective responses uh, when uh, uh, the book is being discussed, right? And you see that there's a really strong involvement in that. And um, I see this as a notion for hope because at least there's no apathy and disinterest. But in obviously, it really uh, pinpoints to uh, places right that we're waiting to be energized in that regard right so i don't even though the the opinions or the debates uh, the quality of the debates you know can be discussed but there is something uh, happening and of course, as you already, Michael, yourself mentioned, this is not a new debate. It has a long history. Other scholars have been contributing very importantly to it, but also, um, I mean, uh, definitely the uh, decade long struggles um, from below by actors. And you mentioned that of, uh, also, of course, um, by black activists, by post-colonial uh, 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 claim makers uh, in Germany uh, has facilitated now uh, a particular space where now this um, debate uh, is being held. Now that's where then the depression notion comes in a little bit. And um, so I'm really um, a little bit still surprised when uh, I read some of um, the debates in the media or also in, in historical journals and reviews. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm just really so sort of, mm, flabbergasted by that, that, you know, this book it offers in such, um, um, productive and constructive way uh, to come out of a particular conundrum that Germany is stuck. And it's, you know, it actually gives the opportunity to come out in dignity from a situation that's actually pretty, let's call it conundrum for now, uh, but the, um, the asymmetry of recognition, uh, the fact that um, the place that Germany globally, and you address that in the globalization of um, the Holocaust discourse, and Germany was referred to here as the important paradigmatic example, how to institutionally engage with that and was used also as a model. And that's, we, there can be, there are different opinions to how successful this was, let's leave it at that, but, right, clearly Germany has globally this position. Right, that it has done that. And at the very same time, the very same place has been denying not only racism for a long time as uh, an institutional racism, but the um, colonial uh, genocide uh, against the Herero. Now, it was 2016, where some sort of acknowledgement, I mean, I, I, it's not an acknowledgement in my view, but um, occurred. And um, uh, I had once uh, done, uh, a short study on um, the responses of the German government to the parliamentary inquiries of a few parliamentarians who were asking um, the government if the Herero genocide constitutes a genocide or not. I mean, it was paraphrased different. I'm just paraphrasing. It was, of course, formulated differently. And in all of these responses of those parliamentary inquiries from 2007 to 2013, I think I had looked at, the discourses that were employed from the government were almost identical with the discourses of the Turkish government when denying the Armenian genocide. And now you had here an overlap in uh, when it came 
an um, unrecognized genocide, a similarity between that country that is most known for denial with the country that is most known for uh, acknowledgement and confrontation. So th this is a situation, right, when it comes to colonial genocide, that um, uh, where then, for instance, mm, uh, maybe uh, if we, or I would phrase this as a question then, when you say then that Papon uh, is a person with Nazi hintergrund, right? What do we do with Konrad Adenauer? right, who as the founder, right, the founding father of the new republic, uh, of the federal republic, um, who was seen as a rehabitable politician to be set uh, by the allies because he was not part of the NSDAP and had not, uh, um, and was in opposition, but he himself was uh, the uh, vice um, president of the German colonial society. So, Right, and that is, I think, where also this notion of rupture, continuity, linearity, non-linearity becomes really an important question. And to us, it relates not only to what was before, but also to what came after. And maybe that's part of the reason. And I'm stopping here. I'm just asking, returning that as a question to you, uh, Michael, um, because I. Uh, I think in the book, the new book, you're also addressing this much more stronger, um, the notion of denial, right? Uh, what, what do we, um, you know, what do, um, what do we do or how do you conceptualize denial in, in that regard um, and, and, this, uh, and uh, 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 in the context of um, uh, looking at um, multi-directional, um, memory or the potentiality of multidirectional memory for denial. Uh, it seems to me that denial so often is misunderstood as a lack of knowledge or right uh, something. It's just not known enough, right? There's not enough uh, knowledge about a particular crime. But when looking, especially in some of the uh, uh, debates and reviews that related exactly to your book, I was thinking, no, no, you know, this is another good example how this is a matter of cognitive dissonance of being very well uh, able to acknowledge one thing and absolutely uh, not being able to understand the very other thing, right? And um, so um, I understand your implicated subject discussion uh, very much in the context of that, and maybe you could uh, uh, open up that and uh, as a, uh, of course, from my field, I'm envious of uh, cultural studies and literary critics, people who can then move between the different levels, right? I will always have to ask, so what about the state in here? And, uh, you know, um, so is it just about the archives of memory or, you know, what happens if we actually really look at all of this? Um, you know, how does this change also ideas about the state when we look at accumulating repertoires, right? Of, of uh, I mean, these genocides, the, Right, as accumulating repertoires of the state, and how do they then uh, re um, assert themselves in discussions like that? Like, how does you know? It's not just a debate between different journalists, historians, academics, but this is a very key debate right now in Germany, which, in the case of Achil Membe, was unleashed by the Beauftragte for uh, anti-Semitism. Right, so it, it was a state uh, led thing. Right, I mean someone who was an agent say so just uh, so much for now thank you uh michael again for okay so far yeah thank you bilgi i mean you can easily see there's a lot on the table already and, uh, and a lot of different topics uh, to discuss let me maybe pick up uh for the beginning one thing that bilgi said and that's uh, because i think that's also uh uh, maybe one of the best things you can say about the book, uh, because um, you know, bringing up this this I mean, really interesting example of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Racial Hygiene in, in Berlin, of course, um, and how you experienced it, so so to say, when you worked there. Um, you said it. Uh, multidirectional memory is uh, is a great facilitator for discussions, right? And. Uh, I think that's a compliment for the book on the one hand, but it it um, it also brings up an interesting question, and I think you related to a little bit to it already, Michael. Um, 
and it comes up in your work again and again. And I think it also some of your critics pick up on that. It's, uh, it's, um, and it, it comes up on different levels. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of politics, so to say, right? Um, so is it, is, it only, um, is it only scholarship or is it activism? You know, what we are doing with, uh, or what you are doing, or what, what you want to pursue with your book. Um, and I think that's also somehow connected. And it's, I think it's just, just important to clarify that or to say a little bit more maybe about that. It's also connected to the question of talking about multidirectional memory. Is that, an, is that a normative idea or is it descriptive? Right when you talk about multi, so does it mean memory is always multidirectional, or does it mean memory should be more multidirectional, or is it a little bit of both? And I think that's also connected to this question of uh, of scholarship or academic work, um, and how much we are involved with it in politics or let's call it activism. And I think you yourself call it activism uh, also um, sometimes in your texts. Do you want me to come in now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's so much. Thank you both. Thank you, Bilgi. And that was really, really interesting. And thank you, Dirk, for, for focusing those questions in that way also. There's a ton to talk about, and I don't know if I can put it all in a good order exactly. I mean, I guess I'll start by one of the things I was thinking of is one of the paradoxes of the German reception in relationship to the earlier reception of the book or the reception of the English language book, let's put it that way, is that the reception of the English language book was primarily scholarly. Now, I have over the years of course, heard from artists, in fact, who've been inspired by the ideas. I have heard from activists. I've heard from young Jewish activists in recent years, you know, trying to, to mobilize this for contemporary political uses in the U.S. during the Trump regime, for example. So, you know, there have been those kinds of, people have picked it up in, in those ways, but really overall, it's been a scholarly reception. And it's been a good scholarly reception. It doesn't mean everyone agrees with it. It doesn't mean everyone has only positive things to say, but it, it became a kind of standard scholarly text, especially in the field of memory studies, right? So there are different fields intersecting here. There's Holocaust studies on the one hand, there's memory studies, there's the disciplinary differences that Bilgin alluded to, which are of course real as well. Um, I tend to work in a kind of interdisciplinary way, but coming, as, as Dirk said at the very beginning, from literary studies, literary and cultural studies. I mean, that's certainly the, the, the field from which my, my own work comes. Um, in contrast, right, to this scholarly reception of the English language version, the, the German reception, so far at least, has been very much a public reception. Right, a feuilleton reception, as, as you've indicated. And that has a very different dynamic, it turns out. And there are diff different rules of the game, apparently. And I'm not, and, and this has something to do with this question of scholarship and activism. The reason I'm a little bit sensitive about that is because I often feel like the book is being received um, as if it were a political manifesto, which maybe at some level is not totally false. I'm not going to disavow that, but it is first and foremost a work of scholarship. And I feel like the so much of the critical reception has not actually engaged with the scholarship, right? And has jumped to various kinds of conclusions based on what they think I'm saying or what they think about me or, or just the terms of the current debate, public debate starting, not starting with MMBA, but, but certainly that's a key moment of it. And I jumped into that debate as well, of course. So, you know, I have only myself to blame, I suppose. So partly I do want to insist that there is a scholarly argument. There's even a historical argument, though I'm not a historian, not the history of the Holocaust, the history of memory, right? It is a book that's about the history of memory. And that has often not been picked up on, right? And so, you know, I noticed, especially in the first few, you know, negative responses in the in the in Die Welt, in the FAZ, even in the Tots, we could talk more about that late, later. I'd love to talk about that. Um, you know, there was, I think, no mention whatsoever of the Algerian context, which is literally half the book. Half the book is about the way that Holocaust memory, 
uh, emerged and transformed in relationship to uh, the Algerian War of Independence, right? And, and the, what I call the age of decolonization. There was no recognition of that. And that's another reason why I wanted to talk a little bit about the Papon example today. Um, that said, you know, um, I have no, uh, I'm not trying to, to disavow at all that there is a political vision here. And I'm certainly thrilled by the idea that it would uh, prompt public debates and that it could be used, um, you know, even for politically partisan reasons in certain in, in certain circumstances, right? I mean, I, I welcome that as well. I think that there's a different, you know, there are all sorts of differences between what happens in a scholarly sphere and in an activist sphere and in the public sphere. And I think it's important not to blur all of those. Um, but I also, you know, certainly would like to think of my work as being able to contribute to both, right? Both to public discussions as well as, as scholarly discussions. Um, in terms of the question of the normative and the descriptive, I mean, that is a question that comes up a lot and, and probably something that could have been clearer in the book, perhaps should be clearer. Um, I guess I, I do see it as both, right? I guess I do believe that... Um, there's a certain structural aspect of memory, which is multidirectional, right? And, and the argument here is basically, right, that what is particular to memory as opposed to history, and again, this is really what I'm talking about is memory, is that it always takes place in the present. In other words, it's always making a constellation between at least two times, the present and the past that's being remembered, and therefore always at least two places, the place of remembrance and the place being remembered, which even if they happen to be the same, which I think they rarely are, you know, when you, when you think about it really in a literal sense at all, you know, things have changed, right? The place is no longer the same place. And so for me, memory as a particular human capacity is, is somehow structurally multidirectional. It's always a constellation of times and places that are being brought together. Now, the complication begins because of course that happens in lots of different ways, including denial, right? It, it, you can remember in order to forget and to deny. I mean, I think that's absolutely clear. Um, and so one of the, the one of the very first pieces, I think maybe the very first piece that I wrote after multidirectional memory was published was, a, was an essay called From Gaza to Warsaw mapping multidirectional memory, perhaps a little bit relevant to today's uh, uh, goings on as well, where I tried to um, distinguish um, different versions and varieties of multidirectional memory in a more complicated and nuanced way than I had in the book. And I tried to map out, right? So if, if memory is, is structurally multidirectional, that doesn't mean that all forms of memory are the same, that all forms of multidirectional memory are the same, not at all, or have the same political implications. And so I tried to kind of map that out on a grid um, between an axis of what I called, uh, well, on the one hand, axis of comparison between forms of memory that equate different histories and forms that offer a more differentiated relationship a la Du Bois, let's say, but then to map that also against an axis of what I called political affect, which goes from competition to solidarity. And when you map this axis of comparison against the axis of, uh, of political affect, you get at least to begin with four quadrants in which you can start to make differentiations and distinctions between different articulations of memory. And Again, I think it's complicated to evaluate those different forms, even once you've mapped them. But it's absolutely true that for me, there is a kind of normative vision, and it has to do with what I call differentiated solidarity. And again, since I've mentioned it, Du Bois is for me the, the, the primary, one of the primary examples, right? That you are able to perceive distinctions as well as relationality across histories and use this not in the interests of competition between different groups or for concurrence, again, a, a term I'm very skeptical about, but rather um, to construct new forms of what I call non-organic solidarity, solidarity across and among groups that don't naturally seem to go together. And so if there's a normative vision, and I think there is a normative vision, it has to do with that, with that notion of differentiated solidarity and of memory as a possible resource for the construction of differentiated solidarities. Not the only one, of course, but as, a, as one uh, possible one. Um, 
I see to, to sort of to, to shift a little bit. And, and, and that essay is included in my new book, um, The Implicated Subject. I'll mention that as well. And I'll talk more about that book maybe as we go. But I wanted to turn to finally to the one last point that, that Bilgin made about denial. It seems to me, and you can tell me if you think this is wrong, I think there's been a kind of shift in the German discourse and maybe beyond the German discourse from denial of the colonial past to what I would call disavowal and a kind of fetishism. And Jürgen Simmer and I talked about this in the essay we wrote for that site. And to me, this is kind of important that what you see is not so much that what, what, you, what we're seeing now is certain kinds of qualified recognitions of, let's say, colonial violence and maybe even racism today and the post-migrant multicultural um, constitution of German and European society, but then a disavowal of their significance in the present, right? Like, of course, there was, we know there was a genocide in Southwest Africa, but what does that have to do with the Holocaust, right? It's, it seems to me that's the cutting edge of the current anti-multidirectional discourse in Germany, if I could put it that way. Um, of course, we live in a multicultural society, but that doesn't mean we should change our memory culture in any way, right? And so here is where I think that the singularity of the discourse of the singularity of the Holocaust in Germany is playing a very different role than it did in the 1980s in the Historikerstreit, when, Habermas, I think, was absolutely right to intervene against the relativizations of people like Nolta. But what I came to realize in thinking about the Mbembe affair and the, and the kinds of questions of comparison that have arisen today is the issue isn't really can you compare, it's how you compare and why you compare. And that the problem with the Nolta position was its, its attempt to exonerate Germans, right? To exonerate German responsibility for the Holocaust. And the comparisons that I see today among decolonial activists, among black Germans, um, post-migrants um, is not about disavowal of German responsibility. It's in fact about the multiplication of German responsibility, right? It's about recognizing that one can be responsible not just for the unique Holocaust, but for all sorts of other forms of historical violence that maybe aren't unique, but are but are nonetheless um, are no less in need of recognition, reparation, uh, and solidarity than the than the Nazi genocide of, of of European Jews is, and that's this is one of the this is a question I'd kind of like to ask back to you guys, is what do people think follows from the insistence on the uniqueness of the Holocaust? I just don't under I literally don't understand this. Are we only responsible for historical events that are unique? No, I mean, that just seems crazy to me, right? That just seems crazy to me. That that so, And this is where it does connect to my book, uh, The Implicated Subject, which is really a book about rethinking historical and political responsibility. And in some ways, it's the multi-directional version of historical responsibility. It says, the fact that you're responsible for, that you may be collectively responsible for the Holocaust does not mean you can't also be collectively responsible for other histories of violence, and that the recognition of those other forms of responsibility in no way relativizes or erases the, 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 you know, the form of responsibility that you've been holding on to in this case, that of the Holocaust. So I'm really kind of baffled by the discourse, but it seems to me that there has been a kind of switch from a straight up denial to a kind of disavowal of the implications. And the, the sociologist Stanley Cohen has this book called States of Denial. And he has something he calls implicatory denial, which is where you're not denying the facts, you're denying that they have implications for the present. And that's what I see as, as sort of the cutting edge of the discourse today. Um, actually, there are coming in more and more questions from the audience. Um, and let me just tell to the audience, I mean, say to the audience, um, it, Please feel free to type in your questions. It would also be nice to have your name with it, uh, but you can also do it anonymous anyway. But uh, so that's the that's the wonderful world of the internet. Um, but it would be nice to have a name with it and feel free to ask whatever question you want to. Um, so now we actually arrived at the current German debate. But I, 
I, I wanted to do a little detour first. I'm not sure if that's if that makes sense, but but also you know going back back to what what Bilgin said about denial, um, because in your in, in multi-directional memory you 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 talk about screen memory, right? So Decker in wrong, so the the Freudian uh, uh, the Freudian term of screen memory, and your you're starting the book in 2009, so to say, um, or whenever you started writing it, um, discussing the interesting question, why is there a Holocaust Museum at the National Mall in Washington, D.C., but why is there no uh, place to remember uh, the history of uh, African Americans, uh, slavery, racism uh, in the U.S., and so on, right? And I mean that tells you something, of course, what happened in the meantime, right? I mean, uh, in two thousand two thousand nine, if I'm not wrong, was also the year when Barack Obama became president of the United States, right? Um, and in the meantime, of course, we have like in uh, you know five minute distance from the White House and from the Holocaust Museum in D.C., uh, we have for a few years now uh, this very impressive. Uh, uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, to, to to take this little detour. So also to take a little bit uh, to talk a little bit about what not only about Germany and the ongoing German discussion, but also what happened in the states in the meantime, and to remind us that your, I mean, at least the beginning of your book is a is a it's a very American U.S. American perspective, so to say, right? I mean, it, it it it's it's situated on you know talking about place and time. It's situated at the National Mall and what is remembered there. Um, so um, so I'm just wondering um, if you could take this detour and uh, because in the meantime, of course, there happened Barack Obama, but also Donald Trump, and the museum is now in place. I mean, it was also it, it was. Opened by uh, Obama, luckily not by uh, uh, Trump, um, uh, and um, but also what went on, of course, in the last years of the Trump presidency, and now uh, the Black Lives Matter movement again, and so on and so on. So, can you just situate it a little bit, your book, you know, it, to, towards what happened in these uh, in these twelve years, also in American politics and. Uh, how that either um, confirmed your uh, perspective uh, on these topics or, or, or changed the whole environment, because now we have the museum. But what actually happened, I mean, what has actually changed in, uh, in the reality outside the museum, right? right. Although we have mm -hmm. now the museum for uh, African-American history. Um, so just this little detour before we get to the German case and then to Austria. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a big question. There's a lot there. There's a lot to be said. And again, I, I think it's important to insist that I would never say that memory is the only field or the most important field necessarily that these things play out on. I mean, I think there is an interesting, um, important mnemonic um, uh, component to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, in that so much of it has risen up around, right, about the litany of names and a kind of mourning, work of mourning um, for the legions of uh, black men and women who have been killed by the police, who've been killed by vigilantes, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that memory certainly plays, I think, a kind of, um, you know, plays a central role in some of those movements, but I would hardly say that memory is the is the central issue there by any means. Um, you know, in some ways you could say that the opening of the Museum of African American History is a kind of confirmation, right, again, that the, that the discourse kind of spirals and moves on, that the opening of the Holocaust Museum, which I myself was skeptical about, skeptical about the need for such a thing initially, but that in some ways it does lead in, you know, to other kinds of discussions, right? It does become a, it does become a kind of nodal point for opening up uh, more kinds of uh, more 
you know, more room for discussions of memory and not just about the Holocaust. And I think that's happened despite the fact that, of course, famously a couple of years ago, the Holocaust Museum itself tried to shut down any kind of comparative approaches uh, to genocide or to Holocaust. But again, I guess my point there would be that that attempt to shut down comparison, linkage of the Holocaust with, say, the refugee crisis or something, quote unquote, um, in fact, just stimulates more discussion. It, it stimulates a response. It, it, stimu it stimulates a kind of spiraling discussion. Now, there's no way that I would ever say that the public memory of crimes against African Americans or indigenous people in the United States is in any way adequate, right, in relationship to the you know, to the actual history there. That's not at all my point. Um, it's obviously a work in progress. And I think there have been developments, certainly since um, since my book was published. It doesn't have anything to do with my book particularly, but, but you know, that, that, that kind of working through of the past continues. Um, the Trump era was one that, as everybody knows, stimulated an incredible amount of multidirectional work on fascism, right, on the far right, um, on forms of racism. You know, I think those discussions are ongoing. I think they're inconclusive in a certain way. But again, what I would say is we've actually lived these last five years or so in particular have been a very multidirectional era uh, in that it's been unavoidable to talk about the resonances between interwar fascism, the Nazi period, the Holocaust, and developments not just in the United States, but again, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Germany itself. Um, I think it's, you know, and, and one can have different positions on the, the fascism question, and people I respect have been on all sorts, you know, all sides of that debate. But I guess what I would argue is that it's, it's unfolded in a very comparative, multi-directional dynamic, which as I would sort of as I would sort of expect, right? Is Erdogan Hitler? Is Trump Hitler? Is Erdogan Trump? Is, you know, Modi, et cetera, et cetera. It's become a kind of global discussion um, filled with analogies and comparisons. And again, I don't love all those analogies. I don't feel that they always serve the interests of better understanding of the present or the past. I would just remark that they're always with us and that we need to work our way through them Instead of, instead of simply declaring them off limits or anything like that. We have to take them seriously, at least as elements of a public discourse and elements of a public deba debate. That doesn't exactly answer your question, Dirk, but maybe it's at least a, a part of a response. That was actually a good response to it. So, uh, Bilgin, uh, do you want to uh, go back to Germany and the current debate? I mean, that's, uh, I mean my feeling mm -hmm. is that that multidirectional memory, I mean, that's, and this is why it's so interesting, you know, that you say that this is how memory always works, or if it, not always, because it can be distorted and denial and so on, but right. learning from history, right. and this is, you know, what everybody usually says, what we want, especially when it comes to the Holocaust, right? So learning from history definitely needs multidirectionality, otherwise it doesn't work because, as you say, it 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 is necessary to connect different things which each other. Otherwise, you cannot learn from history, right? So, uh, so I think this is why it's an absolute central um, point if, yeah. uh, when it comes to uh, to memory and the working of Holocaust memory and what our usual standards are for it, right? That we want to learn something from it, but you cannot learn from it. If there's no multi-directional memory in, if it's only the past and it's unique, um, and there are many arguments why it could be unique or unprecedented, as we say, right? But if it's only in the past and it's unique, then there is nothing to learn from it, right? To learn from it, you need to put it in conversation with other well. things going on, right? Yes, but the comp I mean, for that you want you would need to want to learn, and I think the advantage of the similarity is uh, to have a closed case, um, because what we learn brings up new questions, right? When we really would treat um, the memory of colonialism and um, uh, and you know use you know look at the ruptures, continuities, connections, intertwinednesses 
discourses, ideologies that overlap, then our knowledge also not only about colonialism increases, but also about the Holocaust, plus about contemporary Germany. I mean, I mentioned the name Konrad Adenauer for a particular reason. Um, you know, right now, I fully agree uh, with you, uh, Michael, that the discussion is not the same one. Um, definitely, it is a much more sophi sophisticated one. Um, it's not outright denial. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, so in that way, there's definitely, there's, there's much more discussion, yet the resistance, I think, I mean, I'm mostly interested here in the affective resistances, not even in the cognitive ones, right? But what kind of resistances are there? What are the fears when, uh, that happens when two um, persons with an ascribed migration hinterground, uh, hinterground <laughs> background start speaking about mention with a uh, Nazi hinterground, right? It is not just what is being talked about, but who is talking about uh, these topics, right? So that um, becomes uh, tricky, right? So the singularity helps um, to cope and manage, and it put also some sort of an endpoint. And it was extremely important that you mentioned the attacks from the far right on the existing memory of the Holocaust. That is real, right? And the classes on history is more and more getting reduced in schools. The level of information and education in that matter is definitely structurally um, uh, declining, and it's not seen as uh, uh, as um, uh, as such a vital. Uh, uh, topic than it was before. So that that is, right? So uh, why can't we just close this and just move on, right? Well, we can't. <laughs> and the more, you know, you um, you bring in exactly this multi-directional memory, that closure is difficult. Um, I, you know, when you talked about uh, the question uh, about the US, I would like to make a comparison from there. I just remembered, of course, um, um, the discussion on the concentration camps, right, that um, uh, that uh, AOC had brought up, right? In, in comparison, and the reactions I thought were very interesting, um, where exactly the notion of comparison was brought forward, right? I mean, it was, I mean, there were many voices, but overall, I didn't do a study on it. My impression was that after all, um, the dominant perspective was to say we need comparison, even though there were resistances. And you had a similar discussion in Germany with regard to the refugee camps um, in uh, Greece. And there was no debate. You don't, you know, make that analogy. That does not, you, you, that's just an no-go. You cannot say concentration camp to that. So that there is a difference in that. So while there is change, I would agree, um, I think the limits of the discourse are still quite strong, right? But, you know, of course, what do we uh, measure it with? I think the example with the Nazi Hintergrund showed it also in the German context. So, so much what kind of uh, emotions is again evolved when you just turn, right, and say something and adapt to that, uh, that um, uh, how much um, uh, uh, affective responses come. But um, absolutely, um, these discussions are there, and I think this is exactly the point, right? Like to look that um, no matter how much you also want to put a restriction to this memory or to the um, uh, to the borders of this discourse, nevertheless, it gets permeated, and I think this is uh, exactly uh, maybe also um, you know what you were pointing out to with the uh, when you said that it is multidirectional overall the discourse, and uh, I think yes, definitely uh, that is something to observe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, so many questions for me. So <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's a lot to. I just quickly, in response to uh, what Bilgin just said, I think th I think this distinction between opening and closing is really important to me, right? Because our, I think our discussions about these matters are always have to be contextually sensitive. And again, this is you know in broad terms the distinction I'd make between the disc the debates of the 1980s and the debates today. Uh, in the 1980s, the, the comparative turn by the relativists like Nolte was in fact an attempt to close down discussion, right? To right. kind of, exactly. again, to end German responsibility, to end the importance of the Holocaust. I think today 
it's the singularity thesis which is being instrumentalized to close down discussion. You're not only of what is discussed, but as you said, Bill Gideon, also who gets to discuss it, right? And especially when we're talking about minorities and people with migrant backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. And I think today, at least, it does seem to me that the comparative turn is a way of of keeping things open, right? Again, keeping responsibility, keeping the substantive responsibility for the past open and thinking about how it, it, you know, how it exceeds the boundaries of what we think we already know. And I think that's so important. It doesn't mean that all comparisons therefore are good or all comparisons work in that way. Yes, there are relativizing comparisons. I absolutely believe that. And again, that's why I kind of created this map to try to make some distinctions. But it just seems to me we can't proceed without comparison because it's a basic component of human cognition. Right. It's better to work with it and through it. And I think and I like the criteria in a sense as are we keeping the memory open or are we closing it down? And I think especially in a moment of generational change, we need to be making arguments for why young people today should still care about this, why they should still learn about this history. I don't think we can take that for granted. And again, I think despite the risks, one of the ways of doing that is to connect it to other ongoing things that are important to them in their lives and important to us in our lives too, right? Not just, it's not just a generational thing, but I think you just, I think this is a necessary part of historical education, as Dirk was saying earlier. No, right, exactly. I mean, I think keeping it open means learning from history, right? If you don't keep it open, you cannot learn from history, right? So it's, I mean, exactly. whatever, I mean, whatever learning from history might mean, right? Uh, and, uh, and as historians, uh, I mean, uh, we are, I guess we are very skeptical that people ever learn something from history, but it's uh, nonetheless, that's our societal, um, you know, idea of if we... Uh, um, confront ourselves with these histories, right? That we want to learn something. If we close it, we cannot learn anything from it. Uh, but uh, let me take another detour and uh, not to make it only as a presentation of your old book, but also your newest book, because I mean, it's very closely connected to it and you alluded uh, already um, a little bit to it. Uh, and there's also a question in the chat, which is somehow, I think, uh, um, connected to it, you know, why are ontologizing and groupist categories like migration background and Nazi hintergrund suddenly introduced here? Uh, so uh, maybe very briefly, because I think, I mean, your new book, uh, the implicated subject is extremely closely connected to uh, multidirectional memory and somehow, is my feeling, comes directly out of it, right? And um, and it it... it tries to find a new language for respons talking about responsibility right in our societies um, when it especially when it comes to to complicated pasts uh, and it tries to find a language beyond these usual categories we use like perpetrators and victims uh, and bystanders especially in Holocaust studies of course uh, but also um, uh, different uh, from uh, which might be the closest term to it, complicity, right? Um, but also, I mean, to, just to take a fresh look at, at, you know, the question of responsibility. Again, an extremely important term also for the German discourse on the Holocaust, of course, right? I mean, uh, responsibility is one of the key terms for that, um, why it's also in the transgenerational um, um, dimension it matters, right? It's responsibility. Um, so I wonder if you can say a little bit about the, you know, this new project or this, I mean, it's not new, it's, it's already published. So, but this most recent book and this idea of the implicated subject, because you also, um, I mean, I mean, there is a, there is a autobiographical, um, element a little bit in there, right? I mean, you, um, and that is somehow relates, I think, to this question that is brought up here in the chat, right, with these ontologizing groupist categories and um, and yeah. the talk of Nazi Hintergrund. Uh, so maybe you can, I don't want to spoil it, but, uh, but yeah. so may, maybe you can say a little bit about that because I think it's illuminating also for this whole uh, project. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, to take up that. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, can I just add another question? Because that sure. fits in there. So just sure, so, go ahead. Because yes. that just perfectly fits that we yeah. have another one in there. And yeah. I think it's uh, in one package you can uh, do that. Multidirectional perpetra perpetratorship also worked in other ways. Uh, for example, former Nazis who then became military advisors in Egypt or other Arab states, do you find it opportune to mention that? Or would you then uh, undermine the idea of solidarity? between victims, the Holocaust victims, as called the colonized. So the notion of solidarity and responsibility is also important in your new book. So I thought maybe that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, I don't know if I can answer that last one so satisfactorily, but let me start start from the beginning, start from the top and, and see, see what I can do. Yeah, I, I recognize that issue about the question about ontologizing and certainly not uh, what I would want to do, and I think sometimes maybe our language can, uh, you know, especially in informal settings, can can kind of point that way. But I would put a lot of those terms in in quotation marks, um, and would try to work against any kind of ontologization, for sure, um, while still recognizing that subject position matters. And in some ways, that's what my book, The Implicated Subject, is about. It's about subject positions and not identities, right? And so um, what I'm trying to do is to understand how um, questions of responsibility can be thought outside the binary between victims and perpetrators. Not because I don't think there are victims and perpetrators in real life, of course there are. Perpetrators should be held accountable. But what I'm trying to get at is that I think most histories of violence and exploitation um, and injustice are not just performed by perpetrators, but facilitated by what I call implicated subjects. People who in all sorts of indirect ways contribute to um, the perpetration of, uh, of, viol of various forms of violence uh, or to, to processes of exploitation. So implicated subjects for me are those who enable perpetuate, but also benefit from, or in other ways, inherit um, histories of violence. And so it's it's certainly very relevant to the intergenerational or transgenerational issues that Dirk evoked. I think in some ways that, you know, the second, third, maybe now fourth generation German is sort of the classic uh, example, the classic paradigm of what I call diachronic implication, right? What does it mean to not be guilty of these crimes, but to be responsible for them over the course of generations? And so this does have to do with memory, and it does in some ways grow out of multi-directional memory. But there are you know, two shifts, I think, in the first book. One is from a centering of the category of memory to a centering of the category of responsibility, which is not the same. And then also a shift from purely diachronic issues, as you might have in memory, to thinking about diachronic issues alongside synchronic, in other words, contemporary issues. So I'm interested not only in how we inherit these histories of violence from the past, which make us responsible without being guilty, but also how in the present we are enabling and perpetuating histories of settler colonialism, uh, sweatshop labor in global capitalism, mm, sexual violence, et cetera, et cetera, how we are enabling these things without being necessarily directly perpetrators. So in some ways, I, I hope you can see that I am trying to break precisely with a kind of ontologizing logic, right? That this is not about a fixable identity, but a really a kind of in-between, in some ways, a kind of in-between, though still very much socially situated identity. And I draw on... Um, the theory of intersectionality, and particularly from that original statement of the Combahee River Collective, which I find still so powerful, where they were theorizing interlocking systems of domination, because that's obviously what we're confronted with. Um, but differently from what the authors of the Combahee River Collective statement were interested in, they were absolutely right to be interested in what they're interested in was, was theorizing a position of black women at the intersection of these interlocking systems of oppression. What I came to see is that in that very theory, which would later be called intersectional, what you also find is the mapping the, uh, of subject positions that I would call implicated subjects, right? That we're rarely simply in the position of the victim, though we may be in one history, but when you look more broadly, you find that we're complexly situated. And many of us find ourselves in what I call situations of complex implication, where we have lines of connection to histories of victimization, 
but also at the same time, lines of connection to histories of perpetration and violence in the present. And so one example where I think this is really important, and it's important for unraveling the political deadlock, I think, is say Israel-Palestine, right? Where I think for Jews, um, there's a strong sense that we have inherited right, certain histories of victimization. And certainly the Holocaust is very prominent in, prominent in that, but it's not only that, it's anti-Semitism more broadly, it's pogroms, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, we find ourselves in the present, I would say, implicated in an ongoing injustice, right? And it's that complicated position of both seeing yourself connected to a history of victimization and finding yourself in the rather uncomfortable position of being connected to the dispossession of another people, which I think is what provides some of the affective explosiveness of, uh, of a situation like that. And I think that's not unique, right? I mean, for me, that's something that I'm very personally concerned about, I suppose, and feel implicated in both as a Jewish person in the diaspora, but also as an American whose tax dollars are funding some of what's going on in the occupation. So I feel implicated. I don't feel I'm a perpetrator, but I do feel like I'm an implicated subject. But I don't think this is the only situation where you find that kind of complex implication excuse me, that kind of complex implication. So I guess my, you know, what I would say, both in terms of multidirectional memory, but also in terms of the newer book, Implicated Subject, far from trying to ontologize group identities, I'm really interested in the overlaps and complexities that cut across and cut through uh, different ostensibly separate group identities. And the fact that we, in, that we occupy simultaneously often contradictory subject positions in relationship to different histories. And that's what I'm really interested in. And I just, I just feel that's, a, that's actually, I do feel like that has a kind of political public import to clarify analytically those complexities, right? And that politics unfolds in ways that are um, very urgent, um, but also at the same time, uh, require a kind of unpacking and a kind of analytical approach um, to, to understand what's going on and also to understand the reactions that people have to what's going on. I don't know if that helps, but. Um, we ha I mean, in the beginning, we said we would take like 75 minutes. Okay, I thought that, you know, yeah, anyway, so now we are. Uh, I think do a around, few more minutes. A few more yeah, minutes. We are around 100 minutes now, anyway. So it's, I mean, it's an extremely interesting discussion. And, um, and um, yeah, um, so we should take the opportunity. And there are still, I think, more than 50 people online. So, which is, uh, which is good. Um, and there are a lot of questions. I think we touched uh, on many of them uh, already, um, certain parts of the discussion. Um, here may be one that brings us back to the uh, to the ongoing German debate. Um, I was struck by the recent essay in Die Zeit in which Fabian Wolf writes that he recently shed the illusions that Germans are aware that Jewish life exists outside their field of vision and their way of knowing, that they are capable of understanding that Jewish conversations about Jewish issues have a meaning beyond and apart from what these Germans themselves think or would like to hear. Uh, do you think, so that's the question now, do you think recent debates are succeeding in decentering this German uh, viewpoint? I mean, just, just to, uh, I mean, and I think that brings it all together. Uh, I mean, there were some interesting pieces in beside. I mean, we have this Nazi Hintergrund uh, uh, debate going on. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have also these, uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about that earlier, right, also with what Bilgin said, this still that denial or this disavowal of uh, uh, colonial pasts in Germany, also with the connected to the debates around the Humboldt Forum and uh, looted artwork uh, from Africa and these restitution questions uh, that came up a few years um, ago and, uh, and uh, yeah, very irritating lack of understanding sometimes in the German debate. Um, first, when it comes to Jewish issues, also when it comes to colonial uh, pasts and issues. So um, 
But then at the same time, you see this uh, generation of, I mean, let's let's say weird term, I hate it, but nonetheless, new Germans, yeah, bringing up all these questions. And, and again, what you said at the beginning, taking this history seriously and keeping it open. I think that was one of the most important points for me in this debate on the Nazi hintergrund, right? I mean, there is a there is a young generation of new Germans that takes this history seriously, is seriously interested in it, mm-hmm. keeps it open and asks interesting questions. And you might not always be the same, the same opinion, but that's, for in, in my understanding, that's taking history seriously, right? Mm-hmm. And asking just what is on the table, right? Mm-hmm. And, and connecting it to the present. So this is, I think, this is what we always wanted, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, here it happens, and everybody says, oh, no, you cannot do it. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And so uh, because, the, as, as Begin said, the wrong, the wrong people are doing it, right? Are you allowed to talk about this? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't know. I mean, if, if you, we as, his, you know, I as a historian could never do that. You are a literary scholar. Uh, so, what is your outlook on uh, on the future of uh, German memory? Uh, you know, going from here, from these weird debates uh, since uh, the last year. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you also to John Caitlin. I think for that question. Exactly. And, uh, right. Yeah, the Fabian Wolf essay in Die Zeit is absolutely essential reading. I think I hope I know a lot of people are reading that. I hope if you haven't read it, you will you will read it. And and I and I really hope that it will help people to start to think differently about some of these questions. It was so powerful, it seems to me. And I, I, my sense is that people are taking it seriously. But so have the recent debates succeeded in decentering the German viewpoint was the initial question. I guess I'll go back to what um, Bilgin said in response to the debate about my translate the translation of my book, that she felt both hopeful and depressed. And I think that seems about right. I mean, I think the situation is is contradictory, is my sense of things, that on the one hand, um, there is a strong, I would say it's the dominant strand. Uh, I don't know if it's dominant in terms of absolute numbers, but in sort of discursive power at the very least um, in places like the FAZ and Die Welt, et cetera, et cetera, which is, as Jürgen Simmerer and I called it in our essay, it's a kind of provincial term. It's a kind of, there's a kind of provincialization of, of German memory that's been going on. I think you see it in the Mbembe debate. I think you see it in some of the, some of the responses to my book. I think you see it more broadly um, in the kinds of experience, in the kind of things that Fabian Wolf is talking about in that essay, this inability to, to see beyond the German perspective. That's very real. It seems to me it remains very powerful. It's, you know, to go back to Bilgin's point about the state, it's very much embedded in the state through people like Felix Klein and and others. So I think you can't ignore all of that. That's very real. Um, At the same time, I think there are signs of hope and there are more and more voices who are entering into the discussion and things are shifting. I do think things are shifting. And so maybe some of the aggressive response to you know, that you find in these various debates we've been talking about is partly coming from a sense that things are slipping out of their hands, right? That it's no longer just the older white German men who are going to define the contours of this conversation. And so when you have, as you said, two young, uh, you know, uh, racialized minorities, people with migrant backgrounds, again, non ontologically speaking, who enter into this discussion, yeah, people respond, but that dis- but it doesn't stop the discussion. And there are people there, like you and me and like others, to, to pick it up and to relay that discussion and to try to bring more visibility to it and to try to take it more seriously. And that's why I was I felt it was important to 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 join in that discussion and to join in that debate. We need to amplify these kinds of voices and debate them, right? It doesn't mean that we have to accept everything that is said by someone by virtue of their identity or position or what have you, but to take it seriously, right? Which I thought this intervention deserved. So I think, yeah, I think we see the the I think we see the entry of new subjects of memory more prominently into these debates. But we also see pushback from the centers of power um, who are trying to keep things the same and to hold on to a discourse that just seems to me becoming ever more rigid and, and again, starting to close things down instead of open things up. 
to use that. Um, so I do see a kind of decentering that's going on. Um, but I also see the center trying to hold on to its position as well. And so we're kind of working in that contradictory moment. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that can be depressing um, and troublesome. And it has sometimes to me been that way in some of the responses I've received, but I think it's also an exciting and energizing moment. And again, as, as Bilgin said earlier, you know, the very strong responses to my book, I take that as a positive sign. Right, that it's taken seriously enough to reject it, even. And, and I know that there are enough people out there, including people, and this is the other piece of it that we should mention, including people in positions of relative institutional power who are interested in opening up the discussion to, right? So the Welt Offenheit Initiative, um, you know, the Goethe Institute, uh, people like Susan Nyman at the Einstein Forum. I mean, there are people, the Kulturstiftung, das Bundes, right, which hosted a discussion with me about my book back in January. I think there, there are people with relative degrees of cultural capital who are also really interested in trying to get out of the stalemate and dead ends into which this discourse has run. Um, and there's so much more to talk about here in terms of anti-Semitism and the discourse on anti-anti-Semitism, et cetera. We probably don't have time for that, but people know what I'm talking about. And I think, so I think there's a great, there's a great desire to be freed from some of these strictures. And I find hope in that. So, uh... We are approaching the two hours mark. Um, so anyway, it's a good sign um, because it's interesting. Um, Birgin, I would hand it over to you before we come to an end, maybe. And I mean, it's as we as we can easily see here, right? I mean, it's a it is an ongoing debate, right? And of course, it was not the idea to come to a final. Uh, conclusive, uh, whatever you know, uh, you know, ideas here um, that was uh, that was sure from the very outset, right? Um, it is an ongoing debate. It's an extremely intense debate uh, in Germany, not only in Germany, and it will uh, go on, of course, in the future. Uh, Bilgin. I thought that the last statement of Michael was such a perfect Schlusswort, right? It was so uh, ending on a good note uh, by looking on uh, really um, uh, how we can, I mean, you know, benefit from these kind of productive discussions when they remain, even when at moments when they seem to be destructive also, right? So, and I think that was, um, uh, I think, really important to see that uh, the interest uh, uh, into the book and the very the many topics that we address today, right, show how um, uh, vital um, these debates are. We know, right, any discussion about the past is about the present. So, right, uh, our involvement and engagement with that uh, will certainly continue. And maybe we did not, uh, Dirk, you and I, we did not maybe address really Austria very much now, um, uh, but maybe we just leave this then also to uh, another time. Uh, I find also very long Zoom talks also tiring after some point, and it's wonderful that so many people stayed online, but um, get the book and the new book too. <laughs> and um, uh, then we should probably also think about a second discussion where we can uh, talk about um, perpetratorship and responsibility and solidarity, which was a very you know, important point uh, also that came uh, to look um, uh, how we can, or how these kind of discussion can result also in new forms of uh, differentiated uh, solidarities uh, in that regard. So. I would um, just thank you very much, Michael, uh, for your time, your availability, and also your generosity in bringing in uh, really also many different um, reflections, both on the past and the present. I mean, on your, your different um, in the different uh, longer trajectory of this uh, making and remaking and uh, rediscussing the book, and um, also um, yes, uh, I would just. Uh, Thank also you, Dirk, and uh, if you would like to close it off, so I just thank everyone who has watched it uh, until now. Thank you both. Thank you both. And yes. everybody. Let me join in that. I mean, thanking especially our audience uh, for staying with us for more than two hours. Um, 
Uh, that's a good sign and important. We don't do that for ourselves, although it was a pleasure to talk to you. Um, yeah, I mean, Austria, that's a totally different subject, right? And we cannot do this now. Uh, we have to do it another time. Uh, and the idea certainly of this year is to bring the discussion to Austria, where it has not arrived yet, as far as I can see. Uh, either the Nazi hintergrund debate, although there are, of course, many Austrians with the Nazi hintergrund, um, and uh, and not the Bembo or Rothberg debate, because in Austria, I think it's we still have the dominant narrative that Austria had no uh, part in colonialism. Uh, so, yeah, that makes it hard to discuss these issues here. But uh, maybe we succeeded in bringing this discussion to Austria. Um I'm sure there will be other instances where we can talk with Michael, maybe when the next book uh, comes out. Um, is that a spoiler to say that it's something about uh, migration and Holocaust memory in Germany? I think it is a book together with Yasemin Yildiz uh, coming up. Uh, so maybe that's uh, um, a good point in time to gather together again and to uh, to make another book launch and uh, uh, panel discussion with you then, Michael and Yasemin. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. So thanks again to Bilging uh, for co-hosting this uh, for our colleagues and friends in Graz. Thanks, Michael, for your time in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and thanks again to the audience. Uh, thanks also to Markus Dietrich and Christian Kons who made it technically possible uh tonight and uh yeah i wish you a good evening and uh, all the best and hope to see you soon again in uh, real life bye 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 michael bye bilgin bye bye <clears throat>